Hello everybody, welcome to the uh, CFA program exam preparation webinar from London Fitch Learning. Uh, my name is Peter Menzies and I'm one of the uh, CFA program financial trainers here at Fitch Learning and uh, welcome to all of you for joining me. Thanks very much. Um, what we're going to be uh, discussing uh, in this next session is uh, last minute top tips for the exam, which I hope you'll find very useful. Of course, we have exactly one month before the exam and we want to make sure you get the most out of this one, this one month efficiency smart sensible uh, approach to using your time that you get the best out of all your hard work that you've been doing i'm sure over the last five or so months so uh what we're going to do is just uh, start with a little the, the agenda really for this uh this webinar what exactly we want to cover so a little bit of information about studying with Fitch Learning, what uh, that entails, what you can uh, expect from us. Exam format, very important of course, what exactly is the structure. And then the top 10 tips for passing the exam, which you can see uh, some examples there. The calculator, exam approach, key formulae, tips on the day itself, not to panic. Uh, and then some practice exam questions, see if you're at the right standard already. So if that sounds uh, interesting, then please uh, you know, stay with me and we'll have a look at what's coming up. Um, and if you have any questions, of course, please do uh, put, get that through to us and I'll try to cover that uh, either during the, uh, the talk or at the end. Now, firstly about Fitch Learning, as we have um, almost uh, two decades in the market here um, from London, but also uh, around the world, basically helping uh, candidates through their CFA exam and so 19 to 20 years essentially and many th you know, thousands of uh, candidates every year so you can do the maths we've trained uh, far and wide over a long period of time and we have um, from that experience been able to build up uh, material which we think best helps the average delegate through the CFA program each level has its own challenge but we've all been there and uh, all the uh, central trainers are charter holders and have passed all the exams but know exactly how difficult it is. Now you can choose from a wide range of options if you wish to study through us both in the classroom and online. Um, I think what's specific uh, you know, unique about Fitch Learning is our, our online study portal which is called Cognition. The Cognition portal is uh, adaptive uh, study, adaptive to the sense of what you are needing to spend more time on. It's smart in that it can see, see of course, your results, performance, where you're weak. It will then give you more content in that area. So it kind of prompts you to stay in your weak areas and try to get that to the right level as opposed to you're at the right level already. Let's see if you can really get good at something because, you know, for CFA program, typically you have to be good across all areas as opposed to excellent in just a few. So uh, it is a personalized learning experience. Um, you have a certain time frame, a timetable, which is based upon when you started your study. And of course, if you can hit your deadlines, then you will not be under any time pressure, or I say, you will not be under significant time pressure then to finish and start revising. Consolidate, guys, your knowledge. I know in this last month, you must be very much uh, wanting to just to consolidate your hard work. So we have lots of um, exam uh, questions, mock exams, and sort of aids to uh, the material, which is part of our review package. Either you can come to a classroom and access that, or you can just access it online. Now, Cognition, uh, as I was saying, is a sort of a unique product uh, in the market here because it does, um, I say, adapt to your uh, learning requirements. You can study anytime. Uh, can you imagine, of course, uh, on desktop or via the mobile app, um, iOS, Android, compatible. So you can study wherever you have time. And I think the main idea really is uh, that we break our topics into what we call atoms. So atoms would just be very minor sort of like five minute um, areas which you can cover very quickly. And then you can do a batch of five questions or so on that to make sure that you've understood a small area of the syllabus. But it is necessary as you build, you can imagine the atom, to something larger, which would be a learning outcome statement, which is what the exam is based on. And then, of course, exam questions flow from that. So 
whatever time you have, there's always something you can do with cognition just to strengthen your knowledge base. And you can also get support from our expert uh, instructor team, and say expert because we've been doing this for so long that um, after year after year we sort of get an idea of where the challenges really are for our candidates and we are ready to answer you via the global help desk. Um, you have somebody you can get access to, you know, around the world you'll have a quick turnaround to, uh, to your questions, very quick. You know? a screenshot there of cognition, as you can see, various markers showing you things like, you know, how much time you have to the exam, how many readings you've completed, how many things you have to complete, deadlines, you know, for your next test. So everything is the metrics that you need to know, right? Now, getting ready for uh, the last part of your journey here, I mean, you can imagine um, to boost your knowledge in this last month so you feel extra confident, uh, you can come to one of our two-day classroom review courses, which is available in this month. Um, you can see the major cities that we uh, run that in. So if you can come to one of these uh, you know, uh, centers uh, in these cities, then you might want to you know, access that and log on. I'll show you how to get in touch with our client services people, see if there's availability. But um, you know, the classroom review course is basically question practice with a trainer who will give you lots of aid and support, but expect you to do questions on a time pressure and then we'll debrief and analyze where the tricks are, what you could have done better, you know, different ways of approaching a problem. So, you know, really useful stuff. And if you can't come to the, uh, those cities, then why not just do things from online? You have all the material um, available. You have recordings of the review courses as well. Um, live webcasts of the review courses. So you can, I think you can hear what questions people have, basically, uh, as good as being there. Also something uh, very new this year, we have something called QBank, Question Bank. Basically, if you want to just access um, questions from us and create your own quizzes, you know, uh, however long you want the quiz to be, whatever questions you want it to contain, you know, the difficulty level. And the good thing about that is you can do as many or as few quizzes you like and it will track your progress, so showing you how you are performing against what would be considered like a benchmark for success. So really good stuff. QBank is there. If you just want to create your own quizzes, there's the, uh, the kit there's available. You can do that. Really powerful, good stuff. Uh, standalone mock exams, traditional, of course. You know, five mock exams, for example, for level one. Online and printable. Yes, and if you want to come and sit an exam just to give yourself the experience, of course, of you know, the Scantron sheets and filling in you know, the ovals on a, uh, on a mark sheet, you know, that sort of pressure, then you can actually come to a classroom proctored uh, mock, which would be, let's say, in one of those major centers uh, on a Saturday or, or so in, in, in May. So, you know, to see if you want to do that, please do check the uh, link down there uh, and uh, you'll have information on all of that. But um, you know, think about how you might want to use that material. Now, in case you didn't already know, the exam is um, a six-hour uh, assessment, but it's covered in two three-hour sittings, uh, morning and afternoon, 9 to 12, and 2 to 5. The uh, exam is, um, is 240 questions in total, uh, but 120 per paper. Um, but your performance is seen across all 240 questions, not on a per-paper basis. Yeah? We don't look at it as per-paper. It's a whole aggregate performance, which matters. Question multiple choice, no negative marking, and every question is standalone. So A, B, C options, but you know the distractors, as you probably can imagine, are very good. So you know it's that way. It's tough, but at least you know that if you get one question wrong, it's not going to have any bearing on the next question. They're all independent, and all the questions are segmented. So by study session, ethics and professional standards is the first day session. So that will be the first batch of questions. Quants the next day session. That's the next batch. Economics, so forth, so forth. So, you know, you know exactly where the set, you know, the questions are. So you don't have to do order by order. You can t you do your best topics first if you want. Yeah. Now, calculator is essential. The calculator which many people use, uh, possibly the BA two plus Texas calculator, uh, or BA two plus professional. 
Alternatively, you might be using the uh, HP12C uh, calculator, which is also acceptable. But whichever one you're using, you must be able to get the best out of it, especially for level one, where you're working so fast. So we're just going to remind you about the key functions on the CFA calculator, including the time value of money. So TVM, everybody, I'm sure you're familiar with the operations N, right, IY, PV, present value, payment, annuities, and future value. Remember, when you want to clear the TVM, you press second and FV. Um, and be careful of your signs. Remember, cash in versus cash out, making sure we know the calculators can distinguish money in and money out, otherwise you won't be able to get an answer. Icon, guys, is for intrate conversion. You press the second button and you press the number two. And that's going to give you the ability to enter your nominal rates. Of course, your compounding periods. And I'm sure you want to calculate your effective return. So I hope that's all familiar. Remember, here you actually have to press enter after every entry and use the arrows to scroll between the entries. Data and statistics. Of course, this is for the, for the actual you know, variance and standard deviation that you want to. Second seven gives you access to the data. And second eight gives you access to the stats. Remembering, of course, that when you've got your data, you're entering your X entries and your Y entries. Yeah, and your, 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 uh, your stat function should always be in one variable mode. Um, and, of course, therefore, the Y entries are really frequencies. And the X entries are the data. Yeah, press the down arrows, of course, you get all the uh, mean variance. and Well, really, you get standard deviation, don't you? If you want to get variance, you square standard deviation. Uh, NPV and IRR, of course, there, everybody, you have to use the cash flow function. So CF, cash flow function, and you're entering your cash flows at time zero, time one, and so forth. And then, of course, you're pressing the NPV button to solve, and it says, well, give me an interest rate, and you simply compute it. IRR, again, simply compute what it is in the cash flow function. Um, okay, amortization. Of course, that's the, uh, for the balance sheets, really, for leases and various bonds. You want to calculate the end value of a, of a bond or the interest that's been charged. So you press the second button and the PV and basically say which period you want to begin your analysis in and which one you want to end your analysis in, which is P1 and P2. Break-even would be for corporate finance. So things like, uh, you know, the operating break-even level or just the break-even quantity level. So second six there. And, of course, then you start putting in you know, your fixed costs, your variable costs, your price, etc. So, you know, you lock, lock that in. But your profit, of course, should be set to zero. And then quantity, you can compute. So if you're familiar with all this, great. Uh, if not, there's still time to just check. We have a free resources kit, guys, uh, on this link here. Uh, you can view a guide video for the calculator. Really good stuff. Because um, I remember, you know, level one, the worst thing is you're running out of time. You know, you're spending too long doing a calculation by hand, which you could do twice as fast on the calculator. So know how to get the best out of the calculator. Okay, question practice, time allocation are crucial. Of course, that's common sense, but remember that it is 120 questions uh, in 180 minutes. So 1.5 minutes a question. Um, so yes, 10 questions take you 50 minutes. Read the requirements first. I think especially true for questions like which are long, long, long-winded, like ethics. You get lots of big scenarios, and if you read the uh, requirement, which is if you read the actual uh, answers first, you know what you're looking for. Save time. Don't beg, don't get bogged down in those time track questions. Move on. Leave to the end if you have to, because remember, they're all just worth one mark. So don't spend more than time than you need to. Let's have a look at an exam standard question, actually, to give you an example of not wanting to spend longer than I need to. Here's the example of yield measures in fixed income. Yeah, this is comparing annual yields with different porosities. Annual yields, guys, means comparing the YTM. Or should I say the YTM being also known as the annual percentage rate, which is a simple annual, simple annual YTM. And the, and this, this topic is about comparing. So we want to have, you know, the same effective return. 
bonds might pay at different porosities, but we want to know what would be the APR which gives me the, the same effective return across different porosity APRs. We can do that. I mean, obviously you've got a formula here saying convert an annual percentage rate for M periods to an APR for N periods. And how you do that is you would look to, of course, equate the effective rate of one bond, which is APR M, and uh, the effective rate of another bond, APR N. So if you regard your former stuff there, you take the simple annual YTM, you divide by the number of periods, and then you raise it to the number of periods, and that's going to give you the effective return. We do the same for the other one. But when you're doing that, of course, you're reading and say, well, I need to work out the effective return for one bond, then I need to, uh, of course, um, take a root, and then I need to multiply up again for the uh, other porosity that I'm looking for. And it can get quite fiddly uh, at the best of times. So here maybe is a more efficient way of doing it. Let's have a look. Six year, 4% bond, price at 103.21 per 100 par. Now, uh, the bond yield to maturity, quoted on a semi-bond bond basis, is given here. Now, they might not give you that in the exam, so I guess we should always, you know, just get, just uh, check our numbers. So if you want to just double check there, that's, of course, 12 periods, 6 times 2, and 103.21. Negative, right, the price. We're going to have the payment, half of 4 every 6 months, 100 future value, and then compute the IOI. Okay. How's that? I'm getting uh, 1.7, roughly. 1.70199. And basically, uh, of course, that's not the final answer, because to get the final answer, I need to double this by 2, as it is a semi-annual, simply annualized. So times 2, yes, does come to indeed 3.404. So that is your APR for two periods. Now we have to convert it to a multi velocity. Under this conversion, what is the ultimate G closest to? So, in other words, can you work out APR 12, 12 periods a year? So, Kermit, the first thing is we don't even know what the effective return is on this bond. Why don't we use the icon function? So, second icon, we're going to uh, just check out here. So, when you put second icon, remember, second two, it asks you for the... Um, the nominal rate. So nominal rate, guys, should be the uh, current bond, the yield that we have. 3.404 is APR2. Let's enter that. Up arrow, number of compounding periods per year. Well, 2, it's a semi annual bond. Enter. And then the effective rate, compute. Let's have a look. Yeah, how about uh, 3.433? 3.433, effective. And then, down arrow again, this time the compounding periods is changed to 12, because now we're going to analyze a monthly bond. And down again to nominal, and press CPT, to be just changing now the nominal rate, holding the effective rate, notice, constant, yeah? Hold the effective rate constant, and then that should give you, I believe, 3.38, which is APR 12. See, I think generally quicker than trying to do it manually. But uh, 3.38, notice guys, it's basically smaller because um, APRs generally tend to fall um, for the greater porosities, all else equal, because you have more compounding benefits to make up your return. So 3.38, guys, it is. As you can see, one of the answers was actually 3.433, which actually is the effective return, but that's not what they're asking for. Yield to maturity is a simply annualized return, typically. Okay, other types of questions which come up, of course, are just, can you explain the categorization of cash flows? This is in, of course, accounting. Uh, IFRS is the normal sort of approach we'd look at, but US GAAP, where it differs, we do have to look at it. So here we see, where would you uh, look in a cash flow statement for the following items, if it was a US GAAP preparation, or IFRS, International Financial Reporting, Stand, uh, uh, Financial Reporting uh, how would it differ? Well, as I'm sure you remember, uh, US GAAP is strict and only permits one location. As IFRS gives you a choice. Once you make that choice, you have to stick to it. But let's give you a choice. 
so the rule of uh, rule of thumb, guys, is if an item is essentially belonging um, is linked to revenue, uh, it would be linked to an income statement item. Then typically that's an operating uh, cash flow. Um, so, in other words, interest paid is linked to interest expense. Therefore, it is operating related. Interest received is linked to investment income, which again is an operating type item. Uh, so that also, on the income statement, needs to be operating cash. Dividends received, let's do that one, is also income. So operating related, CFO. Now dividends paid is not shown on an income statement. It's paid out of reserves. And reserves means financing. You're paying off for financing. So US GAAP says it must be CFF. We'll see another one out, right? Now, how about we have a look at IFRS? First thing to start with is IFRS gives you the ability to keep uh, all of the items, um, well, keep all the items in CFO. You could learn it that way. So CFO is a choice you can make individually for each one of these items. Just start with that. CFO all the way. The choice. But then you could argue, of course, well, interest paid is to do with financing, debt finance. So surely it should be financing as well. It could be. And same for dividends paid. It is to do with paying equity finances. So let's put in CFF. Whereas receiving on your investments surely could be then investing cash. So CFI on those. That's right. So guys, how about that? We could have some sort of comparison to do. Um, so that you just learn it, obviously. You just need to know your rules. And then a calculation. Now calculations, um, you've got to be wary, of course, of the examiner giving you lots of distracting information, where again, a time trap question, you get bogged down in detail, which you don't need. So if I got an exam question like this, I'm thinking, okay, before I start looking at the numbers, uh, I'm going to look straight at the question. US GAAP, it wants me to work out the cash of financing. So CFF, basically, and US GAAP rules. Okay, so now I'm going to go back and see if an item is to do with CFF, I'm going to you know, look at it and use it. So, for example, dividends paid. We've just seen US GAAP, it has a financing cash flow. So, yes, that's a tick on that one that is certainly CFF. Common stock issued, again, financing, of course, IPO, follow on, you know, following offerings, need that one. But then we get equipment purchased. Okay, no, that's of course fixed assets. CFI, don't need that number. Bonds issued, I do need the number, CFF. Fixed assets sold, okay, yes, that 60 would be a number, importantly, for CFI, I don't need it. Need that alone. Accounts receivable, that's CFO. Now, these are all operating items now. Inventory, again, CFO. CFO, accounts payable. Wages, yep, you get the idea. All distractors. So all of these numbers saying I don't need them, I don't need to adjust for them, so don't waste my time, right? Let's uh, finish this off then. So therefore we need CFF is equal to, you can do common stock issued, the common issue, the debt issue, all financing, and net off the divvy paid, right? Net off the divvy paid. So I believe, guys, I make that uh, 40, uh, yes, plus the, uh, ones, uh, uh, plus the 160, then minus the 60. Okay, how's that go? So 140. You see about time trap? Just take what you need and move on. You can see some detail just to throw me off. Cost 200, with depreciation 140. The net book value, therefore, is one uh, is 60, sorry. So basically, there was no profit on sale, but that doesn't have any bearing on CFF anyway. Make sure you know how a topic will be tested. Guys, of course, this is to do with the learning outcome statement. Sometimes it says explain, sometimes it says calculate, sometimes define. So you've got to be very wary about which, what is the, the command word, yes, in the learning outcome statement. Um, now, that also gives you the idea that you don't want to waste time learning formulas that will not be tested. 
uh, make sure you know the command words. Um, an example comes to mind is uh, the quants topic skew and ketosis. Skew and ketosis formulas are given in the reading because they want you to see just generally the number is either going to be you know positive or negative. Now skew is raised to the power of three, so it can be positive or negative. Whereas a ketosis raised to the power of four, it can be positive. They show the formula so you understand that, but not that you have to actually do the calculation. So don't waste time learning that formula. It will not be tested. Here we go, some uh, formulas that you do need to know. So, yes, you would certainly be expected to have some knowledge of this. And I'll just guys generally give you a feel of, you know, if you have remembered your stuff. The uh, Remember, portfolio standard deviation is for two assets, only that. So, standard deviation of the portfolio. Remember, you have to take the weightings. So, say W1 squared times sigma 1 squared. W2 squared, sigma 2 squared, and then it's basically two times the covariance, two times the covariance uh, times W1 and W2. There you go, and then of course you have to take a square root. Okay, now, standard error of the mean. Again, this guy's in, uh, in quants. This is to do with your confidence intervals, right? You're building a, uh, a range around the, uh, the, the sample statistic, statistic, trying to estimate where the parameter lies. So you're saying that is going to be standard error is equal to the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Or you can do it as uh, s alternatively over a square root of n. Sharp and trainer ratios, well, I guess I think we'll just say, well, I think you would need to just be aware that sharp, of course, is based upon the uh, overall excess return over the risk of a portfolio, whereas trainer focuses just on the market risk you've taken because it assumes that you're going to diversify away anything else in the portfolio. Jensen's alpha actually best seen through remembering what CAPM is asking, right? That's the uh, required return for equity, so the required return of equity based upon the risk-free rate, and then you have, of course, the uh, market premium, which you deserve some portion of, based upon the beta risk again you're taking. And so Jensen's Alpha is saying, well, have you actually been able to achieve something on like that? So return the portfolio minus, of course, the CAPM uh, required. Uh, beta correlation and covariance, right? So it's beta guys. Well, in fact, let's do uh, covariance because we actually mentioned covariance already. Uh, covariance, of course, can be written in terms of correlation. So correlation between the two assets multiplied by standard deviation one multiplied by standard deviation two. Obviously, that way covariance can be worked out uh, by the um, uh, by by dividing, uh, or should I say, uh, correlation can be worked out by dividing covariance by the two deviations. Beta, by the way, is uh, covariance between the asset, so let's say I, and the market, divided by variance of the market. Okay, with uh, fixed income, duration, convexity, um, remember the most likely thing to watch out for is the approximations, because they do not expect you to do any calculus. It will take too long. Uh, so the approximations is what they're looking for. And what they do... For uh, modified duration, as you remember, is you take the value of the bond when yields go down, they shock rates down, you take the value of the bond when yields go up, and basically you take a, an average of it, don't you? Divide by two, you multiply by the initial value, and you say times the change in the yield, which the change in yield has to be as small as possible to approximate what's going on in the bond curve. You want to get as close to the curve as possible. So yes, that's, uh, and of course then the um, the convexity formula is a sort of, again, same idea. You're taking the, um, you're looking at the shape of the movement of the bond, how much curvature is there in the price, how much curvature is there moving the price. Of course, this is the second uh, derivative, so it's uh, yield squared on that one. Uh, these are the approximations that you're expected to know for convexity uh, and, uh, and for uh, duration. Okay, so let's just uh, remember, Macaulay can be uh, 
worked out from modify by simply multiplying it by 1 plus r, yeah? Um, when it comes to the dividend discount models, you have uh, Gorn's growth model. Remember, Gorn's growth is the price of a share is based upon its future dividend growing at a constant rate, and we simply net off then the, that growth rate off the required returns. So it becomes a sort of perpetuity model with growth, really. The WAC formula is then uh, for corporate finance. Remember, the, the key thing there is you must deduct the tax rate from the uh, cost of debt when you're doing it. Of course, WD, weight of debt, times that. And uh, of course, then the other one, the cost of equity, does not uh, need to be having a tax deduction because, of course, it's not paid until after tax. But interest expense, of course, is pre-tax. So you take off the tax effect there. And then finally, the accounting ratios, uh, profitability, turnover, and so forth. You know, DuPont analysis is probably the best thing to look at here because that covers everything. The ROE, as we uh, say, is based upon three parts, for example. This is like the, the three-part decomposition. So what's the margin the company generated? And uh, what's its turnover? And finally, what's its leverage? And they do like to test this sort of thing here to say, okay, explain why we have an increase or decrease in RE. What's driving the change? You can break it up into its pieces and say, ah, oh, that's the margins are getting worse and the turnover is flat, but because the leverage is growing so quickly, ROE is still going up. Yeah, something like that. But uh, it's best seen through analysis rather than just memorizing ratios uh, randomly. It's too, too hard. Do the questions with numbers and see and see it happen. Okay, so I guess I hope that's useful. Quick reminder of formulae. Um, now, don't focus on your favorite topics at the expense of weaker ones, mainly because uh, the exam will give you everything, really. It'll have, it has uh, six hours to cover all sorts of topics. So if you have got a very weak area, you'll be found out. Uh, cognition is based upon that. Get you to 70% across 100% of the material, as opposed to 100% on 70% of the material, right? At level one, the, qu the quantity is really very important. So keep pushing yourself through, and uh, the weaker topics, yes, um, do try to get that up to a certain standard. We all have a weak topics, right? So everyone knows where it is, you just got to keep, keep cracking on. Uh, the weightings, of course, will help you allocate your study time accordingly. Uh, they are, f you know, they're not they're, quick, they're fairly even, uh, but they're not exactly so. So, I mean, over the years, the curriculum has become uh, more evenly weighted than before, so that's good. Um, but still, topics dominate. Uh, ethics, as you can see here, and FRNA, technically should take the most of your time. They are the biggest weightings, fifteen percent. I certainly think a, a FRNA, financial reporting analysis, does take uh, a, a lion's share of the time because there's so much detail in it. Um, ethics, the questions are so long, you have to practice them for a very long period of time to get comfortable with them. But then you can see, you know, uh, the next big topics would be then uh, equity valuation, fixed income, so valuation topics. You know, so you, you can see you'll have to spend the time on those anyway. Uh, smaller topics, uh, like, of course, an alternatives, and um, derivatives and portfolio management. But they'll be careful because, like derivatives, for example, some people do spend a long time on derivatives, uh, and yet it's only 6%. It's a lot, but it's not on the biggest topic. So you've got to weigh your time accordingly. If you're spending too long on something, and it's not going to be worth that much, it's time to move on. Yes, and talking about ethics, don't underestimate ethics. It is, and they are very, very good question writers in this area. They do pride themselves on the ethics material. It is not common sense. You do have to study their material very hard. Go through all of the CF Institute uh, book, uh, volume one, uh, regarding the examples. Uh, I can't stress that enough. It's the best way to practice. Start with their questions, and then of course you can moving on to other questions like the ones we provide or anybody else. But the Institute's questions are the best, and you must stick closely to them uh, in the curriculum. Yes, and talking about the curriculum, don't overlook those books then. Um, do the questions at the end of each chapter, and uh, aim to do all the end of chapter questions if you can. Um, as I say, doing not just the end of chapter questions for ethics, 
and sort of reading the examples in the actual uh, reading itself. Uh, there's a lot of pages, but it's, it's really good stuff if you want to prepare welfare ethics. Uh, now, when you go to the exam center, remember that uh, you can't borrow anything. So um, you must familiarize yourself with the exam center location, obviously, and their rules. So pencils, of course, you can't use pen, got to use pencil. Eraser, ID, passport, and your calculator. If you don't have one of these things on the day, um, there's no guarantee you can borrow anything. So you've got to be self-prepared. You've got to be independently ready to go. Um, the proctors will expect that. Very strict. Um, you can certainly uh, see the link there uh, down the bottom to just make sure you know all the details. Uh, generally, you have to register in the morning and the afternoon sessions at least half an hour before the exam is due to begin, uh, if not earlier. So make sure you know because being late, of course, is the worst thing. You end up ruining all your hard work because you're late, you lose time, you don't get to go into the exam until after it started, it's a horrible experience for some people, please don't let that happen to you. And although it may seem a bit obvious, but keep your energy levels up during the final few days, because we're all going to suffer from fatigue, right, we're all going to start to dip, uh, when we strain ourselves so hard, it's naturally that your body starts to break a little bit. Um, and the point is, of course, is to work hard up to a certain point and then to ease off so that your energy and strength can come back and you're just ready to go. So like on the Wednesday or so before the exam, Saturday, you start to ease up a bit and give yourself good night's sleep and just, you know, keep yourself sharp looking at key formulae. We're not trying to add significantly new material to your mind because you're just going to end up burning yourself out of energy come the exam, you're just too burnt out to do anything. It's a horrible feeling, wouldn't it, to waste all your hard work. So guys, there it is. Um, our sort of key tips and strategies. And you know, if you want to take it further, here are the people you can contact, discuss your learning options further. Um, please do get in touch with any of them. But uh, whatever happens, I wish you the very best of luck with your studies. I hope you have success uh, next month. And I look forward to seeing you or hearing yeah, from you soon. Thanks very much, guys. Any questions, uh, I would have taken them. But um, if you have no questions to ask, I'll wish you a very good day. Thanks very much, guys. Bye for now.